Hey guys, Paper Bird here. Today I'm doing the mid-year book freakout tag 2017. I was tagged by Camel at What Camel Reads. Thank you very much for tagging me. I've never done a tag before, so bear with me here. I'm gonna have the questions off to the side and we'll just go through it. Uh, question number one, best book you've read so far in 2017. For me, that would be The Return of the Caravels by Antonio Lobantunes. This book completely destroyed my mind. And it's based on a book or an epic poem. Um, it's called uh, Luciadades by de Camoes. It's a classic Portuguese epic about the travels of Vasco da Gama in India. And um, this book was interesting because it's supposed to be a retelling of the Luciadades, although I just didn't, I wasn't able to really pick that out very well uh, because this book works on so many different levels and it's also like kind of interspersed with contemporary times. Um, but yeah, the way that this guy uh, does his writing is done in such a heightened way. Like you hear writers in interviews talk about how they learn during the editing process to kill their darlings, you know, and that's a phrase that I've come to kind of despise in a sense, <laughs> kill your darlings. It's like suggesting that you take out something that was pleasurable for the writer in at the service of the story itself, like it wasn't moving the story forward. Well, I always thought it'd be interesting if um, a work was done the opposite way, that it was just only the darlings and nothing else. And to me, that this is what that book felt like. You know, some books you read and you feel like the author hits his stride, hits his or her stride and just goes on this flight of fancy, but it only lasts for like a sentence or maybe a paragraph a couple times throughout the entire work. Well, this book to me felt like it was done from start to finish. It was an entire, one entire flight of fancy. And you know, I can kind of see how he was able to compose it, but um, the the endurance that must have been required in order to maintain uh, this heightened language was so admirable. Like it was almost beyond human comprehension. So I don't know, I'm maybe going overboard with the description of this book, but yeah, this was definitely my favorite read so far. I'd like to do a review on this. I just need to let it sit and absorb a little bit more. Number two, best sequel you've read so far in 2012, that would be Suicide by Edward Louvet. This book, you know, I call it a sequel. The book that preceded this is called Auto Portrait. And the way that that book ends and this book begins uh, almost seems like it was designed to be read together. Um, Auto Portrait was kind of like cataloging first person of uh, a person's everyday life. And this book is uh, recounting by the narrator of a friend who had committed suicide very early on in this book. And just um, going over the memory of that friendship, uh, but then it does something very uh, disturbing and it slips into the second person and it takes on this sort of self-accusatory tone, almost as if the narrator is looking at himself in the mirror and just damning, damning himself and it just became extremely haunting, this work here. So yeah, I consider this the best sequel. Question number three, new release you haven't read yet, but want to, that would be Eugene Lim's Dear Cyborg. Uh, that book, I think it was just recently published by FSG. And I've been tracking his career like over the last couple decades. To me, he seems like uh, a workhorse or a disciple of a certain strain of literature, like given his um, editorship of like smaller magazines and presses in the past. Um, just a champion of like certain types of writing. And, you know, I've followed his blog, I followed his good re read reviews, and he never steers you wrong uh, with his recommendations. And I've been meaning to read some of his um, books that he put out probably by himself. I think it's uh, Fog and Car and The Strangers. And it would be cool to, I actually did see Dear Cyborg at the airport in San Francisco. So I guess in a way, Eugene Lim has arrived and broken through, which is, you know, something I'd say he should be proud of. The other release would be Antoine Volodyne's Radiant Terminus, I think it's called. That book uh, got on my radar because I think Brian Evanson either recommended it or wrote an introduction to it. I don't know. On that one, I think I might be getting caught up in the hype because I really don't like Volodyne's work, at least what I've read of it. I think I read Naming the Jungle, and I just don't remember anything about it. Number four, most anticipated release for the second half of the year. This would be another writer that I had kind of followed the progress of. It's uh, Gabe Hudson 
whose first book was a collection of short stories called Dear Mr. President. Um, I always thought he was an interesting case because, you know, I read something by him very early on, and it was a short story of some farmhands going out into the field and castrating some bulls, and it was just done so well. It was uh, so much restraint. It had this, like, whiff of Cormac McCarthy, and I had such high hopes, you know, but then when this, and, you know, and also knowing that his um, literary uh, history just um, books that he's talked about, that he's read, you know, he loves Blood Meridian, uh, has read it countless times. I think his dad would read him Ulysses as a bedtime story when he was like five. So he seemed very, um, and, and then he also went to uh, Brown and the marketing material always says that he's won the John Hawks Award over there. So I guess I had certain expectations. But then when this book came out, um, very, um, very different uh, it was just um, sort of this post postmodern new sincerity type writing that was very popular at the time. And uh, except like he was putting like even more sugar into it, you know, with the sincerity as like open heartedness that was almost kind of cringy in a way. I had this sort of asshole ish idea that he was a postmodernist at heart and getting up into the system and fucking it up from the inside and, you know, putting out work that could be taken at face value and really applauded where he's really just kind of laughing um, inwardly the whole time and so like his new novel is called Gork the Teenage Dragon um, so I'd like to go and check it out and just kind of see what it's about I'm probably totally wrong and um, just projecting here question number five biggest disappointment that would be Jelu Naom's Zenobia uh, I picked up this book just because of its title. It's kind of a dumb reason. Um, the name Zenobia, to me, any name that has the letter Z in it kind of conjures up this idea in my mind of the character being like an old person dispensing wisdom, like the Elder Zosima in the Brothers Karamazov. Uh, I, I kind of was thinking that was a trope that, you know, writers can just reach out to and grab. And I really want to investigate and see if that's what this writer did with that character's name. And initially I was delighted to find out that the Zenobia in this book is uh, a young girl who is kind of naive and innocent and the uh, um, object of the narrator's affections. So that was cool, but then it, it kind of devolved into this, um, I don't know, this practice, this um, practice of surrealism in this story. Uh, and he hits upon this mode, which you figure he can just continue on in, but it seems so lifeless to me. Um, and I don't know the techniques that were employed here. Uh, I mean, he's, he's definitely coming from a perspective of an experienced, almost like a rocket scientist, but who can't be bothered to clean up his room or tie his own shoes. He doesn't make the work alluring in any way. Um, as opposed to like the techniques um, done by Felipe Alfao in Locos, um, kind of like an early work of postmodernism. But this was done in a more hesitating, like almost endearing way. Uh, this was done more like been there, done that. And I just, I just felt like it was a tiring read and it almost felt like it would have been tiring to write. And my hats are off to the, um, my hats is off to the, the translators here. Um, who somehow slog through this. Um, I don't know if anybody knows anything about this writer and maybe could educate me uh, on the significance. And hopefully it's more than just that he's a Romanian surrealist. Uh, biggest surprise, that would be Felipe Alfao's Locos. I did a review on this book not too long ago, so check that out. Favorite new author, that would be uh, Antonio Lobantunes, without a doubt. This guy has like quickly shot up to like the upper echelon of writers that I admire. I went to San Francisco last month and there was a bookstore in Japantown that was, where's the other one? <clears throat> that was called uh, Forced Books. And so I've got a couple of his works. So really looking forward to checking out some of his writing and it's amazing to think that like last decade um Saramago was also alive so you had these two writers almost at the scale of a Faulkner you know or at least like the successor of a Faulknerian tradition working together at a time 
At the same time, in a country that's the size of the state of Indiana, newest uh, fictional crush, that would be the character of Luisa in this book, A Heart So White by Javier Marias. Luisa is the young spouse of the narrator Juan, they're newlyweds, and she acts as his accomplice in his quest to find out this dark history of his father and uncover some secrets. Um, she is able to navigate that investigation and help him with it in ways that he's not able to. And she's just such a supportive, caring, loving character. Um, it just is, she's endearing. But what's disturbing about it is, um, and I don't think I'm imagining this, is that, uh, you know, there's some question as to her fidelity maybe towards the end. So that was very disturbing. Newest favorite character, that would be the character Hannah in this book, Homo Faber by Max Frisch. I just finished reading this book and Hannah is the is a young girl, she's like 20 years old. Um, she kind of hooks up with this older narrator, Walter Faber, who's in his 50s. And she she's a charming character. I think they made a movie based on this book. It's called Voyager. And Julie Delpy plays the character of Hannah. I kind of want to check that out. I'm a huge Julie Delpy fan. I still have fantasies of Julie Delpy uh, in white. I'm getting lost here. Newest fictional crush or favorite character? So yeah, it'll either be Louisa and Hannah. Book that made you cry. That would be Interstate by Stephen Dixon. I just did a review on this book and I was in tears like within the first 10 pages of this book. Uh, stories about a murder of a young girl on a highway just told over and over. And the first chapter of this book uh, is just amazing. Um, yeah, this book, you know, I don't cry too often, I guess. But yeah, this story really hooked me in. There's another uh, work that brought tears this year. That was Break It Down by Lydia Davis. That's a short story. And I just reread that. You know, I used to read it a lot when I was um, younger. And it was like kind of a depressing time. I read that story almost like medicine, like every night. I must have read it like 200 times. And just rereading it again brought back all these memories of that time. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was a really comforting short story. Um, it's, it's good to know like when someone else um, can articulate a type of universal pain and uh, do it in such a way that it can help you along. Question number 11, book that made you happy. That would be uh, Edward LeVay's Auto Portrait, which I don't have here. Um, that book, just reading it, you know, just a cataloging of uh, everyday, almost mundane life. Um, it just, just play by play, you know, it was just so identifiable, but almost kind of done in a droll way. And just makes you, makes you um, feel like you're not, you're not alone, really, because like, you know, you might be in a different country, uh, but there's still some commonalities that everybody experiences as humans, except he, I think he has slept with an inordinate amount of women and the way he described that um, makes me wonder, you know, or maybe I'm just not there yet, but probably never will be. Uh, favorite book to film adaptation you saw this year, that would be Satan Tango. The film is done by Bella Tarr. That's a long film. That's like eight hours. And uh, I actually watched that while I was um, doing the dishes. Uh, it's it's an embarrassing, shameful way to experience uh, such a great film. Um, I did watch uh, A Tour and Horse by Bella Tarr uh, at the movie theater, and that was one of the most memorable cinematic experiences I've ever been to, but also one of the most painful. Um, it had an intermission, and I'll never look at hot steaming potatoes the same way Again, but yeah, Satan Tango, um, Laszlo Krasno Horkai, the writer. I like what I like film adaptations that take what um, that kind of differ from the book itself. Like a play by play, uh, faithful adaptation is boring to me. I like seeing the discrepancies um, because those kind of indicate more of the writer kind of like pushing himself or herself out of the, the boundaries of the book itself. Uh, but it's interesting here because Krasna Horkai, who is the author, um, also was the co-writer of the movie. So it would seem that he was complicit in some of those discrepancies himself. Um, but yeah, towards, I mean, some of the Bellatar's um, narrative techniques are so slow that, you know, I, I would, I hate to admit it, but I would like watch on my computer 
and I would have like the window um, kind of snapped to the side with the movie playing and I have another window snapped to the right side and I'd be watching like YouTube videos. <laughs> so it's just, it's just an embarrassment. Favorite review you've written this year? That would be, um, actually I don't write reviews. Um, book two version, favorite video you've done so far this year? That would be John Updike's Couples. Um, that video is, that's different than most of my reviews because it's just way more visual. And I actually don't talk about the book all that much in that that uh, review. It's more of an experiment because um, I took my eight-year-old son and I sat him down and I was like, you know, because I like watching these booktube videos, uh, but I wanted to see what his reaction was. So I let him watch like maybe 10 different uh, videos from different channels. And I said like, okay, tell me when, at what point would you click away from this video? And without fail, he would click away like within five seconds of watching the video. There were only two booktubers that he would watch their videos all the way through. One of them was Richard Reeds and the other was Memento Mori. So there's some sort of X factor with those guys. But uh, but yeah, my goal was to make a video that uh, he could watch all the way through without clicking away from it. And for me, it's, it might be a little harder because I mean, I'll just use my hands and I'm holding a book, you know, it's like not very exciting. So I just kind of made a troll video and uh, it worked. Most beautiful book you bought so far this year, that would be this edition, Satan Tango by Laszlo Krasno Horikai. This was put out by New Directions. I really like it when, you know, a dust jacket is, is one thing, but it's really a piece of paper and I don't really keep it on a book that much. I like it when the design is integrated into the hardback itself. Um, another book I recall, uh, The Secret History by Donna Tartt, original Knopf uh, hardback, that was pretty well done. And this one here, Satan Tango. And the last question, what books do you need to read by the end of the year? Um, that one, I don't really have uh, anything I need to read in particular. I think I'm just going to continue on in this pattern that I've developed of reading uh, writers that I hadn't read before or hadn't read in a long time, maybe picking one or two works by them and uh, also interspersing some poetry in between to kind of inject some charged language. But uh, but yeah, it's just um, I tend to favor books that are kind of dense and dark um, in a way because uh, for me, just story and characters and um, that that sort of stuff is just the last thing I really am interested in. It's kind of weird. Like when I when I see that an author is writing in a very flat, transparent prose style and is primarily interested in telling you a story, I kind of get turned off and bored by that. I know that's the point of reading for most people, um, but uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's sort of like um, contemporary rap music. You know, a lot of times, you know, with mainstream songs, you hear them, they start telling a story. And you go with them on this story journey. and uh, But then, like, how many times do you want to listen to that song over and over and them retelling you that same story over and over? And it's usually not going to be something that original. Um, for me, I, I kind of like the music from back in the day when it's more... It's more like a confluence of, like, the production and the delivery and the cadence. And the lyrics could be the last thing that really matters. It could be just whatever, gibberish but just the sensation of it all working together. And that's what I like to find in books. I like to pick books that uh, that do something with the style um, more so than the story itself. You know, like if the style is transparent, if it's like a clear window pane, not interested. But if the window pane is fractured or dirty or warped in some way, that to me is the most human aspect about the the work itself, you know, because that would be the most unique thing about the work. It's the signature of the author rather than the story that's being told. But um, that's the uh, that's the mid-year book freakout tag. Thanks a lot, guys, for watching. Um, I know it's getting kind of like past mid-year at this point. Um, but yeah, if I were to tag some people, if you made it this far to the end of the video, uh, I'd like to tag Orpheus, of course. I love watching his channel. Um, that's funny, like one of the last videos that he made, he was he started off and he was like, uh, I'm going to keep this video short because most of my videos last pretty long. And the time on that video is 30 minutes. Um, 
So yeah, I'd like to tag him. Be inter he has a lot of good selections. Another person I would tag would be Agnes from Beyond the Epilogue. I don't know if she's making videos anymore, but I really enjoyed watching her talk about books. I miss watching her videos. So that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we'll see you on the next book review, and thanks for watching.